With threats to our nation waiting around every corner, adaptability is more important than ever. When conditions change without notice, quick strategic thinking is crucial. And with obstacles consistently impending, determination is essential in overcoming them. It's this willingness, decisiveness, and resilience that sets Marines apart. With our fighting spirit, we don't just fight battles, we win them. Marines are the constant our nation counts on to fight the unknown. And through adaptable problem solving, we do just that. Learn more at Marines.com. Getting engaged is a moment worth cherishing. A one-of-a-kind ring that you design at Blue Nile can help your love sparkle. Just choose your diamond and setting. When you've found the one, you'll get it delivered right to your door. Finding the right engagement ring can be nerve-wracking. At Blue Nile, you'll have the expert guidance needed and a diamond guarantee that ensures you're getting the highest quality at the best price. Cherish all of life's moments and save up to 30% at BlueNile.com. That's BlueNile.com. Lucky Land Casino, asking people, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? Lucky? In line at the deli, I guess? Aha, in my dentist's office. More than once, actually. Do I have to say? Yes, you do. In the car before my kid's PTA meeting. Really? Yes. Excuse me, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? I never win and tell. Well, there you have it. You can get lucky anywhere, playing at LuckyLandSlots.com. Play for free right now. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. For three successive Olympic Games, it's been the cyclists who've been Team GB's most successful sport in terms of medal return. It's been a similar story at the Paralympics, where Para-GB cyclists have topped the cycling medal table in Beijing, London and Rio. It's one of the undoubted success stories of sport in this country, but it's not been without its challenges along the way. This is Great British Bosses from Anything But Footy, your Olympic and Paralympic sport podcast, and this is the series where we meet the men and women responsible for running sport in this country, whether at an elite level, at grassroots, or in some cases, both. I'm John. And I'm Michael. And we're at the Medal Factory in Manchester, the home of British cycling, to find out how they're aiming to repeat those feats this summer in Tokyo. But British cycling has a far bigger and wide-ranging remit, which is having an undoubted impact on the environment and the mental and physical health of the whole nation. Chris Boardman's bike started a revolution in Barcelona in 1992, no one could have imagined how this sport would grow and evolve in society and with communities. Running this organisation is a huge responsibility. I'm Julie Harrington. I'm Chief Executive of British Cycling. We are in effect eight different sports and so, you know, we obviously want to, as you referenced in your introduction, we want to get more people on their bikes for, for fun and recreation for the environment. But from a competition point of view, our domestic sport um, spans eight different sports from BMX, downhill mountain biking, um, track road, the ones that people tend to, to sort of be more aware of. But we're seeing massive growth in some of those um, more urban disciplines. Uh, which I think is really good for, for the sport and for developing an audience. Julie Harrington joined British Cycling in May 2017 after a career in horse racing and with the Football Association. I'm an avid sports fan, as I know, know you are, having listened to a few previous editions of the podcast. But um, uh, my background is actually marketing. So I, I was working in the brewing industry for, for nearly a decade um, where you're just trying to get more people into pubs um, and to drink more beer more often and now I'm trying to get them to do more sport more often so um, sort of same challenge we're competing for me for people's um, leisure time really Um, but in the brewing industry as you know you you tend to sponsor a lot of sports it ended up being the favorite bit of my role Um, so I was involved in Euro 96 and um, from a Carlsberg Tetley point of view activating um, that event and that that um, was probably the turning point in my career where I decided I would rather work on the sport side than the sponsor side. You like a challenge, British Cycling Chief Exec, many years at the Football Association before <laughs> that. Those are not two organisations that are, you know, going under the radar, shall we say? No, and I, th- I think um, one of the real um, bits of job satisfaction working in sport is that reach that you know you you are you are working in an industry that people talk about and are interested in 
Um, and if you're passionate about it, it's likely to be that your mates down the pub are also passionate about it. So I think it sort of goes with the territory that it, you tend to um, not be below the radar very often. And when I looked you up and researched you, you worked for people like British Airways, as you say, Carlsberg, Tetley, Whitbread. Would it be fair to say that corporate life might have been an easier route for you than the <laughs> world of sport? Um, definitely. Um, certainly easier, but I think, you know, for less job satisfaction and, you know, nobody wants to be on their deathbed going, I, I, wish, I, I wish I'd been braver. Um, and I, I've... I haven't regretted for a moment the shift from sort of corporate life into into the, the sporting arena. Julie spent six years with the FA with special responsibility for the completion of St George's Park, the National Football Centre in England. When I joined it was a, a field in the middle of Staffordshire um, with a bit of a hole in the ground for the foundations working out of a porter cabin. Um, but hugely proud looking back and, and really exciting seeing the impact on the women's and the men's game and, and certainly um, the number and, and um, diversity of coaches that are coming through the system now, it, it, it makes me really proud. The only way St George's Park um, would get built was through taking on debt um, and so my job as the first MD was to make sure that the Football Association could service that debt and that we had enough commercial income from other sources so that the 23, I think it was at the time, England teams could train there um, rather than, you know, there was no real sort of DNA that ran, that common thread that ran through all the different teams because some of them might have been training um, at Carrington, some of them might have been training um, at Loughborough um, and to really have that um, mentality where you've got a common thread that runs through everything about being an England player, we felt it was really important to have that home. Um, but St George's Park does a lot more than that. It, it's really uh, that centre of education as well, where the philosophy of, of having more better players um, will eventually lead to more better coaches. And, and watching from afar now, it, it's, it's really really great to see that blossom. 2011 when the the centre was being designed it, it, we had to remind the architects that the 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 senior the the elite changing rooms um, didn't need urinals because they were also being used by the senior women's team um, and there was a real sort of culture of, of just adding them on at the end um, but to have from the world go from, you know from being a hole in the ground um, the centre to be planned for women's and men's football in mind. It was incredibly gratifying seeing seeing um, that work go from strength to strength under Kelly Simmons and Sue Campbell. It's, it's great. Shortly after um, being MD of St George's Park, I was asked to um, take over um, control of Wembley Stadium also. So I was um, um, operations director. And so I was in my office at Wembley. Um, I think I was preparing for... Um, Spurs to take on their um, residency when they were having the work done at their own stadium um, and, a, and a headhunter rang. Um, I, I'd obviously been watching um, you know for as a sports fan I'd seen um, the huge growth and success that British Cycling had had both on the world stage but also um, in terms of growing participation and um, I'd also from a St George's Park point of view, um, been been working with people like Dave Brailsford to come and speak to the coaches around that relentless attention to detail, and you know I think Dave is still involved in um, the technical advisory board there. Um, so I was really aware of of what was um, a, a great track record at British Cycling on the world stage. Um, and I'd also been aware of some of the newspaper stories that were bubbling up around um, allegations of bullying, allegations of um, doping. Um, and, and so when the phone rang, um, clearly my interest was, <laughs> was piqued. <Yeah. laughs> and, um, um, and, you know, I, I, I was hooked from there, really. You're listening to Great British Bosses from Anything But Footy. We're the Olympic and Paralympic Sport Podcast. And in this series, we hear from the men and women responsible for running sport in this country. In this episode, 
We're in Manchester at the home of British Cycling with Chief Executive Julie Harrington. Personally, and, I, and I'm sure lots of other leaders in, in sport um, uh, have got the same mentality, if everything in the garden was rosy, I don't think I could have added any value. Um, we'd, you know, we'd been incredibly successful. Um, real boom in participation. Taking over the reins at that point, I'd have probably been on a bit of a hiding to nothing, really, um, because the only way, in in media terms, you'd have been, you'd have been, they'd have been waiting for me to fail. Um, but I think. The fact that there was a parliamentary select committee hearing in between my first and second interview, um, which was fun, um, you and you do some due diligence and meet some people and have some discussions. And I really got a sense of an organisation that was incredibly successful, had grown incredibly quickly, had some great people um with the right mentality but i could add some value in terms of um just putting in place um, a few layers uh, of integrity governance um uh, and i don't i don't think of that as boring stuff i, th- I think of it uh, Important as stuff. and really protecting our riders you don't want a young rider you know when a story breaks around doping you don't want a young rider to be feeling in any way that there is a suspicion hanging over them. You want everybody who works in sport to be able to confidently say, no, that's not the case. Um, and and so I'm really passionate about some of the work that goes on behind the scenes here so that um, if there is ever an incident or an accusation that we can back up the processes that we've got in place. If at the very top end of the sport, on that world stage, um, you really need to, to have faith in, in, com- in the competition, that it, it is a fair competition, because ultimately that's what you know the Olympic spirit is all about. And just getting to Olympics, just really being proud of the fact that we are sending the best of us to go and compete on our behalf. You then want to be able to look in the mirror and go, we're sending the best of us, and that's enough. You know. What was the first thing you did then when you arrived at British Cycling? So before I arrived, it, it was trying to, to meet as many people and, and talk to them about what it was like here. Um, and a lot of the people who had given a decade of their life to the success of British Cycling were feeling a little bit beaten up. Um, because you know what it's like when there are um, stories that break in the media. You only ever really see part of the story. Um, and this is an organisation that is incredibly broad in what it does. And uh, it's an organisation that attracts people who have a, a true vocation, not necessarily just for competing, who have a true vocation because they believe in cycling for the power of good that it actually keeps people fit, healthy, that it's great for the environment, that it's great for congestion. So all those people who, you know, are actually two thirds of our organisation, um, were feeling just pretty beaten up that everybody was pointing at British cycling and the old tall poppy syndrome. Um, and I think you used the words metal factory in your introduction. I really hate that phrase because <laughs> it no, but it implies that the, the talented coaches, athletes, support staff. You know, we are a people business. You can't just put any old rider in in the beginning of a sausage machine and we'll turn out a gold medal winner at the end. What it relies on is dedicated and talented people. And in any organisation, whether it's boxing or football or or cycling as it was, when you get some of those challenging stories, and a lot of the time they're for the right reason because things need to change, um, but it does taint everybody within the organisation. So we needed to um, quite quickly make sure that we had a, a team of people who knew that we valued the contribution that they were putting in, but also, um really really look 
in depth at some of those areas where our governance had failed and there was the um, something called the cycling independent review which had a good independent look at us and said that at the heart of some of these stories was one thing which was a failure in governance Uh, and governance is a big word but it's really just how are decisions made in this organization who's marking whose homework you know are we all marking our own homework in which case mistakes will happen and you know you need to um, have that transparency Um, and I think for all organizations and for society as a whole people are just expect more Um, every year people just expect more of leadership in sport leadership in government you know the whole um, you know positive impacts of things like the me too movement um it means that we need to have good governance and good decision making at the heart of everything we do we're a people business um we're not a factory turning out widgets and so you can only go at the speed of um your slowest person um and so i think what's been really important is to recognize the fact that you can't wave a magic wand and change culture um and so um think it hasn't always been plain sailing and of course i'm an impatient person i want things to um um be finished really quickly um but there is there is no end really um for those people who work within it for those um riders who we support um but also we want to be getting on with the with the good work of you know the three big areas for us are the world stage which tends to get talked about a lot more but also that healthy domestic sport from kids who are racing their bikes all the way through to masters whether that be on downhill mountain biking or cyclocross and um, but also to the just more people using their bikes more often to commute and, and stay fit we want to get on with the that future work Um, That means attracting funding, it means attracting partners to work with it, because we, no national governing body can do all this work on their own. You need to work with people. Um, And every time there's, you know, a story about 2011, um, it just changes the conversation. British Cycling's vision is to make cycling the number one sport and activity in Britain whilst also becoming a world-class governing body. When you look at us uh, and the reach that we have compared to other Olympic sports, there are over 20 million people who ride a bike every year. Um, And so, you know, in in terms of us being a a great cycling nation, um, it's bigger than bikes, really. It's about if those 20 million people don't do it, necessarily to race their bikes they do it because it's life enriching whether they're commuting their work it might be that they've got a busy week and that's the only time that they can get in their you know their their cardiovascular work it might be that they're um, just trying to contribute to the environment and less congestion on the roads Um, so I, I think it's a big and lofty ambition Um, And we're on year three of a sort of four year um, program. And we've already, we're already closing in um, on our ambition to get two million more people on bikes, which, you know, is a is a is a huge achievement. One of the things that um, we um, are really passionate about is working collaboratively with other cycling and walking organisations. So. You know, we're, it's not like we're the people's front of Judea and you're the Judean people's front. It's a, uh, um, we're um, British Cycling, but there is also Sustrans, there are also the Ramblers Association and Cycling UK, and we're all working together to to positively in, influence government because every department we can be part of the solution, whether that's education, because obviously cycling's a life skill, and as you said, there's a childhood obesity problem, whether it's the environment whether it's transport, whether it's health, because we know that people who ride a bike regularly are 50% less likely to have a heart attack or stroke. That is massive. And so the whole um, move to social prescribing, so you could put people on statins or you could encourage them to do our sofa to sport eve challenge. Um, We know that cycling has a massive positive influence on people's mental health. And 
you know, you you read the stories about a mental health crisis in this country, um, and just the the positive impact of people getting out on a bike, um, we know can can contribute to people's sense of well being. So, we think we can be part of the solution, but I think it's going to need a not only a joined up a, approach from government, but also a joined up approach from those organisations working within cycling and also walking. How important then are people like Dame Sarah Story and Chris Boardman and, and your other ambassadors, if you like, that are, are taking this agenda to the public? They have been a massive asset and it's thrilling to see people sort of post-riding career and that they want to contribute to give something back and clearly Sarah's still riding and um, but you've got people like Sinead Reed as well and Sinead's um is working with Sheffield I think it is um and um being that um because you could have an unknown sort of suit who's banging the drum about um cycling and walking but part of the um the, the point that these ex-riders or current riders can really relate to the general public you know they and they they also want to give something back people think of elite sports people as being quite selfish and quite single-minded but our award ceremony on um saturday there's the 60 years um celebration uh, so many of the young riders that were coming on stage and and perhaps it is a generational thing but unprompted in their Q and A's, many of them um, focused on what was important to them was something contributing to something bigger than their own success, to actually having some sort of societal impact, which is is really pleasing. Part of the strategy is backing major sporting events. The Tour of Britain has equal prize money for men and women. The Tour de Yorkshire is a legacy event from the Tour de France. And the region also hosted the World Road Racing Championships in 2019, whilst Ride London is now also held annually. The major events are a real shop window for our sport. I, I'm not sure there will ever be the same sort of tribalism as football in terms of the replica replica jerseys, but it's certainly in the last um, decade or so grown um, massively. Um, but I think it's the shop window that you can inspire not only the cyclists of the future, but just the number of people who offer to volunteer. And that's, is that, they're the people that are the glue that really hold society together and give you that civic pride that, um, whether it's the Tour of Britain and, you know, a, a section's going through Kendall or it's the Tour de Yorkshire, there are so many people who want to get involved uh, and the real sense of community that that brings. And you know that at the roadside, potentially um, are the riders of the future. The reason that towns and cities welcome um, major bike races, it, it, there are many different reasons. Um, certainly with road racing, it's free. Um, so how many uh, major sporting events can you get so close to the global stars of the sport for free? Um, and so so that is definitely part of the attraction but in terms of the economic impact but also what people are really you know it's difficult to measure um but we are getting better and there is real effort into how do you fully capture the social impact and um, because we all feel it we all feel that when this country hosts major events there's there's a real sort of sense of the whole country being in a slightly better mood and that civic pride. Probably starting from Euro 96. Absolutely, yeah. You know, oh, everybody wearing their um, Snickers hats, snooping up, queuing up for the... Uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, and uh, so how we measure um, not only the pounds and, and, and pence, but the, the broader positive societal impact... Um, uh, of hosting major events I think is really important. You're listening to Great British Bosses from Anything But Footy. We're the Olympic and Paralympic Sport Podcast. And in this series, we hear from the men and women responsible for running sport in this country. In this episode, we're in Manchester at the home of British Cycling with Chief Executive Julie Harrington. I do not believe that a positive culture and sporting success are mutually exclusive. Um, 
that we have been on a massive growth curve um, and inevitably the rest of the world will catch up. So I think Tokyo will be our toughest Paralympics and Olympics ever. And um, we were talking to some of the um, Paralympic stars who were just back from uh, the Paralympic World um, Championships, Track World Championships in Canada. And they said it was tangible. How, you know, we still um, had a really good medal haul over there. Mm. Um, but, you know, people are, are uh, I think they used it as an example, um, one of the world records that was broken over there had increased by three seconds, which was just massive. But we know um, that our, our overseas nations are, are, are massively catching up. Um, so we think Tokyo will be harder than ever before. Um, what we have been really focusing on is some of the newer disciplines like BMX Freestyle Park, BMX Mountain Biking, um, and looking at where we can gain some um, competitive advantage there. And, and I think if we um, have a broader, fewer but broader medal hall would be just as successful because um, the opportunity to introduce cycling to new audiences um, it, it, to continue kicking on and growing um, will be increasingly important for us. Every one of our medal targets is intelligence based so you, you know the, the attention to detail that British Cycling has been famous for it's about breaking every single discipline down and understanding who is riding how fast across the rest of the world it will be tough. Well, Julie, good luck to you and your team. We wish you every success, both in Tokyo and with your broader ambitions. And we promise never to use the phrase medal factory ever again. Julie Harrington, Chief Executive of British Cycling, thank you for speaking to anything but footies, great British bosses. Podcast Network. Lucky Land Casino asking people what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? Lucky? In line at the deli, I guess? Aha, in my dentist's office. More than once, actually. Do I have to say? Yes, you do. In the car before my kids' PTA meeting. Really? Yes. Excuse me, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? I never win and tell. Well, there you have it. You can get lucky anywhere, playing at LuckyLandSlots.com. Play for free right now. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details.